My name is Dr. Josephine Palermo, and my superpower is creating business cultures that transform organizations team by team. Today, I'm joined by Sandra Lamb, who is an organizational psychologist with a master's in psychology and an MBA. Sandra specializes in organizational health, well-being, psychosocial hazards and risk assessments and interventions. Today we discuss the changes in the occupational health and well-being legislation in Australia and what that means for employers. Well, welcome Sandra. It's so good to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming along because there's been some really big changes in the way we think about healthy organizations, the way in which psychological health in particular has, mm. has, has been embedded in some of the um, legislation, but also just in thinking and leaders thinking. And I think COVID-19 and the pandemic had a bit to do with that. So I'm really excited about talking to you about all of those things. But before we go into that, I'm also excited to see you. We, we're, um, we go way back in we terms do. of our connections through organisational psychology. But maybe you can introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Thanks, Josephine. It's really great to be invited to this podcast as well. So I'm really looking forward to a bit of a casual chat with you about the space that I'm a little bit overly passionate about, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know if you can be overly passionate about health and safety. Um, I am an organisational psychologist and I've been uh, as registered since... Oh, I think 1996. So um, it's yeah, it's been a long journey, um, and I'm currently the managing director of FIFO Focus and Pementus, and both are companies that are responsible. Well, um, we we aim to help organisations build psychologically healthy workplaces, which is all your mental health work, but also a lot of the legislative work requiring um, organisations to look at psychological health and safety. Oh, that's wonderful. And we're going to dive into that a little bit, Sandra. How, give me a little bit of your backstory. How did you get into this space, you know, in terms of organisational psychology, but then also health and wellbeing? Yeah, you know, I'm one of those people who wanted to be a psychologist when I was eight. Um, really? <laughs> really. Oh, wow. Um, that's it's young. A, it's a bit of a, oh, it's very young. I think I just <gasps> always wanted to be um, someone who makes a difference. Oh, even at a very young age and so psychology was always going to be what I would head down but then when I went into uni um, even though I had this concept that I'll do clinical psych which is what most people think about when they think about psychology yeah. I was so interested in commerce as well so I did some commerce units as I was doing my undergrad um, and all the marketing and you know all of those finance side which is really odd um, and then when we got to choosing our master's program, I picked organisational, which was the very last minute. But it was a case of me wow. realising that I love the blend of people at work and, and organisations and, of course, the individual well-being, but also how it all fits together. And that's essentially how I ended up in org psych. Um, my making a difference sort of drive has always been in play as well. I did aid work. Um, internationally for feels like eight eight years as well. It's just helping some of these developing countries in the space of HR and and justice. So I've always been that way inclined, Joe. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so so let's let's look at what's happening right now. What are you seeing? Because you you do work with a lot of leaders and organisations in that in that space around um, occupational health and safety, but from a psychological perspective, what's going on at the moment? There's been some changes um, to legislation in particular. Could you take us through that? Yeah, there really has been a lot of change over the last couple of years in particular, where, I mean, in a nutshell, a lot of the changes in legislation is about moving, not, not moving, it's really elevating the psychological health component of safety. So we all know if you work in any sort of um, industries which involves a lot of injuries. S physical safety is always at the front of mind um, and a lot of organisations always talk about safety first which is fantastic and as it should be but it's always been focused on physical safety and it's only been the last year or two and in WA it's been since March this year where the new Work and Health, Safe, Work and, Work Health and Safety Act 2020 came into play 
um, where, where, where organisations are now responsible also for looking after people's psychological health and safety, not just physical health and safety. So it's, I think a lot of organisations are wondering what on earth does this mean and what does that mean for me and now I'm legislatively bound to do something that I know nothing about. So there's a lot of uncertainty and fear associated with it which is very reasonable. Um, so yes, this, most organisations are now trying to learn what this all means for them. And, and do you help define for them what that psychological health and safety is? Yeah, we sort of do it from a bigger picture perspective. Um, we say w essentially what the Act wants us to do is to create psychologically healthy workplace, which really means a, a workplace that promotes workers' well-being, but also proactively prevents harm. Um, and when, talk things, when we're talking about things like psychosocial hazards, we're talking about the design of the work, um, how work is managed, how it's coordinated, there, there's some things in there that can also, over time, with a lot of frequency, can actually cause harm as well. So that's really what we're looking at. And Sandra, can you give some examples of that that you've seen? So what, what, what would be some things that you would define as psychosocial hazards? Sure, there are quite a few. Um, we're thinking about things like work demand, so workload, too much workload, you feel like you can never come up for air, that's one. Uh, lack of role clarity, meaning I don't know what's expected of me. In fact, I don't even know what my priorities are. And some, some jurisdictions put in role conflict as part of role clarity, meaning you may have two leaders that you sort of report to in some way and they're requiring opposite things from you, which, as you know, if with that level of uncertainty and the power differential, you'd, you'd be stressed out. Um, and then there's other things like uh, poor change management, lack of reward and recognition, um, poor, poor relationships in the workplace, so an inappropriate behaviour. So in particular, we're talking about bullying, harassment, victimisation, sexual harassment, of course, those sorts of things when they're not managed as they should be. Um, yeah, things, things like that. So, so it's much broader in a way than what we've, we've seen in, in the work and health safety area isn't it? Sandra? Yes and I think people need to realise when we're talking about psychological health and safety we're not talking about just the individual but it's the collection of risks that could occur with a group of people because of the way that work is designed. So for example when we're talking about workload it's not just workload for one person because everyone has different um, um, tolerance levels for workload but it's in in the main a lot of people are experiencing too much workload a lot of people are not understanding what's expecting expected of them so organizations are now required to take a more of a risk management approach to look at where this is occurring because it could cause a lot of harm and you know that that is actually really just amazing and it's 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 joyous for me to hear that because it, you know in some ways we've been doing a lot of work in the organisational psychological space around work demand and understand and helping leaders understand how to manage that for mm. you know groups of people for cohorts for the organisation but i'm still like i know in my practice i'm still confronted with leaders that basically say well it's just got to be done mm. and they they're right at the top you know these are ceos at the top of the organisation they are pushing these unrealistic demands down uh, into the other layers of the organisation, and it drives this behaviour. So, so it, but, but at the same time, it's it's um, very intangible that that factor, isn't it? You can't put your finger on it because if you if you look at it from an individual perspective, it's perhaps a little bit easier. But from an organisational perspective, it can be a little bit difficult. How do you how do you put your arms around that? How do you know? That, that the organisation is addressing that, and we can stick to workload as an example, yeah. and that they are addressing the, the workload issue from a health perspective, a psychological health perspective. So when we deliver training, we ask organisations to look at the data that they have that sort of illustrates there's something not right. And when we're talking about data, it could be HR data. So you're looking at you know, the, the absenteeism rate, the turnover rate, the injury rate for the health and safety side of things. You, there may be some information in the exit interviews. There may be um, a, attrition rate is actually higher than normal. That's when you say, well, something's not quite right in our organisation because first of all, we shouldn't be recruiting people and then they disappear or we're recruiting people and they're getting injured. 
Um, then the next stage of that is to really look at um, identifying what hazards are at play. It may, may, may be workload, it may not be workload. So there's a fair few tools available out there to help organisations assess psychosocial hazards that may exist. Um, and that's what I would say would be the next step. So if you get an indication from your existing data, and it could be culture surveys and engagement surveys, that says, well, something's not right in relation to these things that sound like psychosocial hazards, then I would do either a, an, a specific psychosocial hazard survey, depending on the size of your organisation, or I would run some focus groups to say, hey, what's going on? Are these things at play? And does this happen frequently? Or um, how long does it happen for? And how severe is the impact of that? That's, that's what I would do. And from there, we would actually put some controls in place. So it's not just a case of, I think there's this going on and I guess that might be happening, but it's really measuring it because that's what, that's what the legislation says. You really need to be measuring it, putting some controls in place, testing the effectiveness of controls to see whether we're addressing that particular risk. And then we get into those feedback loops, don't we? Because because we, we know that a lot of organisations perhaps do have those pulse surveys, they do the engagement surveys, and many of those engagement surveys go into some of these issues. But then they might debrief the staff if you're lucky, and then really nothing happens and nothing exactly. changes. Exactly. So the, the legislation basically says we have to take a risk management approach identify the hazards, assess the risk, put some controls in place, measure the controls effectiveness, and then doing it all over again, um, which is really different to when we are required, not, not, we're never required to do any cultural and engagement surveys. Com companies just choose to do that. That's, that's when they go, oh, I want to find out what's going on with the organisation. Oh, well, there's this and that that's going on. We may address this, we might not address that. We'll just, you know, just try this, which is what very invariably happens but with this psychosocial piece if it's elevated in some areas we're actually required to do something about it that's the big it, difference it is that's a huge difference it's, it, I mean to have that in the act it's a huge difference yep. because that we know that that's good practice isn't mm. it it's uh, so to have that uh, that tool or that that in some ways that you know enforcement I think is really uh, interesting I wanted to ask you about psychological safety because a lot of people, you know, that's this, this term has been popularised. A lot of people un, are hearing about psychological safety um, and, and perhaps are concerned at, uh, about psychological safety. How does psychological safety fit into that schema of, you know, so, psychosocial hazards? Is it a psychosocial hazard? Is it a, is it a group of hazards? You know, how do you, def how do you kind of connect the dots around that? That is such a good question, Joe. mainly because there is a lot of confusion out there about psychological safety versus psychological health and safety. So in a really quick description, psychological health and safety about, are about the hazards that can cause harm and we are required to control the risk of those. Psychological safety is about speaking up, feeling comfortable, getting comfortable being um, challenging how to do things better or challenging when things aren't right. There's no legislation around psychological safety, but it's an environment, it, it creates the right culture that would help psych health and safety thrive as well. So then the question is, which one comes first? <laughs> which one should I focus on first? Um, my view is if I had only funds to do one, I do psych health and safety because your legislation requires you to do that. However, there's also research about some of the different interventions you can take to address psychological safety, which also sounds a lot like psychological health and safety. So I'm one of these people who says, well, if I'm going to spend money, I'm going to get my biggest bang for my buck. So I'm going to see which one I can focus on first. So things like role clarity is really important. Team um, efficacy, meaning teams getting to do work that is, that's able to be achieved. Um, and supervisory support. Uh, those three fall into both psych health and safety as well as psychological safety. So I'd be focusing on those. So yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, I think that's really <laughs> clear. And you can see how people can be confused by that. So I'm sure that you're going to be defining and differentiating those terms a lot. Yes. You know, so, so I can see that that's happening. Where have you seen some really good practice in this area around particularly perhaps um, 
identifying psychosocial hazards and then really putting in those controls, you know, really addressing those hazards. Have you got a few cases, uh, and you don't have to mention names, but we can celebrate yeah. them if you like, yes. um, about, you know, like, in other words, what does good look like in this space? So there is no perfect way to do this, and I haven't seen it done perfectly either, mainly because it's so new to a lot of people. Um, there's not a lot of uh, traction yet on what people are doing well and what people aren't doing well. What I would say is it would, I would suggest that if you're looking at the holistic approach of psychological health and safety, meaning um, you'd be looking at the preventative piece, which are psychosocial hazards and identifying those, creating a culture of care, which is very much a preventative piece as well. Um, and then you're doing the promotion bit, which is promoting positive well-being and promoting thriving. And you're doing a response bit, which is re um, having mechanism in place to respond to people who are struggling with mental health. And then having a recovery piece, which is the injury management return to work piece. If you have a piece of all of those as an integrated strategy, you're heading down the right line. Because doing things in piecemeal just won't really work. I can see how that wouldn't work at all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'd say it's that and uh, organisations really should be starting off with training people up on what psychological health and safety or psychosocial hazards are and how to manage them. I think that's a first step, but also training people up in the right order is really important. So what I mean by that is um, you, you should be training up your health and safety and HR people first, then making sure your systems are available to capture any psychosocial hazards and risks and then having assessments and how to deal with those in place. Then you would train your leaders up and then you would train the rest of the organisation up. Um, there's times when we've made this mistake of training the whole organisation and then they'll go, oh, well, that's great. So now if I identify a psychosocial hazard, where do I go? And I go, oh, oops, um, yeah, good point. So that's a lesson learned from us. So we say plan the training is very critical because people need to understand what's going on, but do it in the right order. And, and systems, Sandra, because I know some smaller organisations need systems as well as larger organisations and often larger organisations do this very in a very kind of integrated digital way. But what, what about if you're a smaller organisation? What's a, what's a good way to think about a system that can capture these hazards? You can really just do a spreadsheet. <laughs> the spreadsheet ah. that says it looks like these hazards are in place and then we ran a focus group and this is what they said was um, how frequently it happens and how long it does happen for and these are some controls that we came up with together and we're going to implement them, them by this date, starting from this date and this is who's responsible. It's your classic action plan. That's all an organisation really needs to nice. do. So it's not hard, is it? You know, because sometimes we overcomplicate things as well. And particularly we think it's, you know, particularly for smaller organisations, I'm thinking, you know, even medium to uh, large organisations, it's it can be really daunting. But it's not that hard to just create a spreadsheet. But it, then it's the governance around that. It's what you do with that information. Yes. It's what makes it hard is the word psychological. Because anyone who's not a psychologist freaks out and think, oh my goodness, am I responsible for making sure that person doesn't have a mental health break? I mean, I'm not qualified to do that. In fact, should I just step away from it? Is ignorance okay? Um, I think that's the issue. And that's where we need to sort of debunk that. When we're talking about psychological health and safety, if you think about the hazards we're talking about, it's any leader has control over it. Absolutely. It's nothing sure. to do with your brain. It doesn't talk about anxiety and depression. It doesn't talk about all of those sorts of things. So the term psychological, don't be freaked out by that. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. It is good advice because it is. It's, it's, it's almost leadership basics when you think about it. Yes, that's right. Mm. That's right. So, so you were talking, uh, when we were speaking about this a while ago, you were talking about the need for um, a, a capability around collaboration to make this work in an yes. organisation. Can you explain a little bit um, about your thinking there? Definitely. So the whole psychological health and safety falls under a safety act. It doesn't fall under a HR act. But when you think about the hazards itself, work demands, role clarity, um, reward and recognition, that sounds very hr -y to me. Um, so we really... If you want to really address those particular hazards and risks, 
we really need to have health and safety work hand in glove with HR. Um, it's really not going to work if you don't do that. So that's why I say with this whole collaborative piece, it's absolutely bare minimum have your HR people work with your health and safety people um, because you won't address any psychosocial hazards and come up with good risks and controls or risk assessments and controls without that collaboration. That's true. And, and because it's also a, a very different way of speaking about what we would normally think about as factors, issues, concerns, you know, things that predict uh, organisational effectiveness or, yes. or health and sustainability. And so HR have a very different language around talking about that, whereas your safety people, they are very used to talking about hazards, risk assessment and control. So, yes. um, so, so that's where you kind of have to have a, a blend, don't you? You have to have them both coming to the same place. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the language is really critical. Um, you're, you're right. So when I think about health and safety, they're talking about controls. Um, and I don't think health and uh, safety, sorry, let me start again. When you talk about health and safety, they talk a lot about controls, but HR don't use controls as in the same way at all. So health and safety talk about this hierarchy of controls as a means to determine what are the most effective ways to address hazards. HR people have no clue about that. <laughs> so um, that's where the sort of cross education piece really needs to come in. Yeah, that's interesting because they're not normal bedfellows on other things. So, but it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely makes a lot of sense. Have you seen? Do you do that in your work, Sandra? Do you bring particularly safety people and, and HR people together in the first instance? We try very hard <laughs> to do that. So I think there's some realization um, of the sort of crossover now. But before, it's it's not really, it's not really, because HR will say, well, no, that's a it's a work health and safety act. It's not a HR responsibility, and that's when they don't delve into the hazards itself and not seeing that the hazards are very HR related. Absolutely, I remember when I used to teach into the masters of organisational psychology at Deakin, and I had one. Uh, lecture on or one tutorial on the Work Health and Safety Act and because I wanted students to become aware of that mm. um, because it, 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 it has so much um, it, it's, it's almost like a tool for us it's it is but we need to be aware of what are the the things that organizations need to do by law what are the what are the things they will be you know obliged to do and there, there's enforcements and, and you know consequences and actually Sandra what are the consequences well, that's a very interesting question too, Jo. Um, it's, there's actually jail term um, and, yeah, jail, and big fines. And with the legislation now, you can't, our organisations can't just get insurance to cover them. Um, you have officers, and this is whole, delving into a completely different, deeper space legally, but there are officers of an organisation who, if they don't deal with these sorts of things, are actually liable for fines or jail term and they can't just say oh well I'll just get you know my insurance company to cover me and it'll be fine it just doesn't work like that anymore the and the fines are, are very quite high very high very high wow so that that and that again it, it, you know we don't want to we don't want to reinforce a stick here you know you you'd want some pull approaches you want to be able to do this because we know it actually is good for an organization to have people have clarity of roles to have them have achievable work and to have teams working together in a way where they're not only achieving on a weekly and monthly level they're getting better at what they do because of the conditions and we know that that's good for the organization overall so mm. so but but to overlay that with a set of enforcements now mm. it, it you can see how it just means that that the stakes are higher and that we need to prioritize this and that's the message really is that this is now something that people cannot put their heads in the sand about exactly so leaders need to really be on on top of this and i know a lot of people and organizations freak out when they say oh it's legal so i, I don't know what to do and i have to really do this really well i, I just think of it like this when you're trying to sell your organization to an individual you want to recruit them you look on your website and you look at all the values and what you're trying to espouse to be that's really what you're trying to do you're basically saying come and work for us because we care about the skills you bring to us and we want you to thrive in the work environment 
we want you to work really closely as a team so the organisation does really well so we can make a difference in whatever way we want to, whether it's for shareholders or whatever. Um, and really the health and safety, your psych health and safety is really saying, let's just create the mechanisms to allow for that to occur. So at its core, that's what the legislation is trying to do. Yes. So if you're, if you're an organisation that says, I care about people because the key, people make a difference to our business success, then do the things that help your people. That's it, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit of a no-brainer. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> For us, anyway. Yes. But of course, you know, it, we, I, and look, we understand organisations. In organisations, there are competing priorities, and sometimes there are organisational goals that that mean that, that, you know, you can't focus on people as much as you'd like. But, but what mm. we're talking about here is that some things are just not negotiable. In terms of... Um, organizations and maybe maybe for particularly maybe for HR practitioners what's the yeah. first step they could do or take Sandra because I you know I think that this is there's a message in there for them definitely and, and you know and, and as you're saying this is new this is new territory for yes. a lot of those practitioners so yeah. what would you what would be your advice 100% get some training on psychosocial hazards and risk management 100% because only then will you know what we're talking about um, and then secondly, the next step would be looking at what you currently have in play, whether you have certain activities, sur surveys or data, to try and marry it together. You don't have to throw everything out that you currently have to just focus on the psychosocial piece because chances are you're already doing some things, you just haven't branded it psychosocial hazards and risk 100%. management. Um, and then you would learn how to do the risk assessment bit with your health and safety people. Or if it, you don't have health and safety people, get experts outside who help you do that sort of thing. So really, it's not, it's not throw everything out and start all over again. It's really just take stock of what you currently have and try and integrate it with what the legislation is saying as much as you can. If you can't do this on your own because you don't have the capabilities or the capacity, get somebody else to help you with it. Just that initial step, I think that's just to make it less scary for you. That, yeah, absolutely, Sandra. And, and how can people contact you? And, and we, can we put some, we'll put some resources in the show notes too. Sure. I think that would be great. But how can people contact you? Because I know that you can provide that training and you're specialising in this area. So yes. First go, step, for go, go for LinkedIn. <laughs> um, because um, we, we have websites, but I think if you just want to just come on LinkedIn and just message me or connect with me or whatever it is I'll send you in the right direction um, and yeah. Sandra we have listeners that are not in Australia so where can they go I'd go LinkedIn as well <laughs> <laughs> Sandra um, Lamb in Australia yes Look that's it so um, I think that's the the best way I'll, I'll do check my LinkedIn messages um, I, I'm trying to do that a fair bit more now yeah. otherwise it'll be our website fifofocus.com.au um, but that's really focused on the, the resources and mining industry. And if you're not in that space, you will say, oh, no, she doesn't deal with that. We have, we have Pementus, which is the other company, who don't deal with FIFO and resources. So we can assist you in that space. Great. Fantastic, Sandra. Look, it's been a pleasure. I think, I think this is the first conversation. I can see how we could, you know, we could have a conversation about one type of psychosocial hazard, obviously. And maybe that's a, a series that we'll look into next year because I think that you know, we can definitely do that. Um, but thank you so much, Sandra. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, it's been great. You. <laughs> and uh, just before we go, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, no. Uh, well, maybe the, the main thing is don't be afraid of this sort of stuff. There are a lot of people on the same, in the same boat who's trying to work it out. So don't be afraid to ask help and things like that. Um, yeah, definitely. You're not alone with this at all. Fantastic. Thanks, Sandra. <laughs> All right, Thanks, Joe. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.